All right, Blake Cousins here, and I've got an incredible guest for you today. He goes by the name of Brian Forster. You may have seen him on his YouTube channel. He has about 125,000 subscribers, and he runs a tour company over there in Peru called The Hidden Inca Tours. And we're gonna be supplying the link to his incredible YouTube channel and his website. But Brian Forrester explores ancient lost worlds and a hidden history on location videos made by the adventure exploring Peru, Bolivia, Egypt, even Hawaii, Easter Island, and other exotic places. With a special emphasis on evidence that's advanced technology and human history are at least 10,000 years old. Well, we've got video and it's going to be quite exciting. Brian has agreed to do a four part series right here at Third Phase Moon where we go all over the planet and check out these ancient structures could they be made by aliens that's the big question isn't it all right well let's uh let's get right to it so i want to go over this new video that you just put out from peru and this uh face in the mountain got me right away can you tell me exactly the location what does this face represent was it carved out of the mountain well, it's located at a, a location called Oyente Tambo, which is at the northern end of the Sacred Valley, pretty close to Cusco, which was the Inca capital. And uh, it's a, the profile of the face is approximately 500 feet tall and more than 500 feet above the valley floor. Now, most people would think that it's just a natural phenomenon, but the first time I saw it, being a sculptor, I noticed that there's no vegetation growing on it. So I believe that it's an artificial construction and uh, the only uh, plant growth that's on it is where the beard is. And what it represents is an ancient teacher called Viracocha that supposedly came from a distant land to teach the local people. Well, so the locals over there believe that this is some kind of, uh, not artificial, but actually man-made for a purpose exactly all right so as we go through the uh ancient city here we come along this little water fountain you describe it as to have to be almost impossible to create this even today it almost has to be a perfect geometry explain what this water feature represents well, the interesting thing is that the Inca discovered megalithic ruins, such as at Oente Tambo, and one of the examples is that fountain. It probably wasn't originally a fountain, but the Inca carved a slot in the top of it in order to be able to let water flow. And the fact is, when it's properly maintained, the water travels perfectly through it and lands in the center of the bowl below. And that takes a lot of engineering in terms of hydraulics because the channel has to be the exact proper width and depth and also the angle of the channel has to be perfect in order to achieve this. The, the fascinating thing that I wasn't allowed to show is if you run your finger across the front of it, you can actually make the water itself stick to the stone and then when you flick it again, then it pops back out. It's a bit of an engineering marvel. Well, so the theory basically here is that the Incas discovered this advanced technology, uh, ancient civilization, and then built itself around it. The Incas were there after the fact of something that was there before, long ago. Definitely, at uh, many different locations, at Oyente Tambo, the city of Cusco, Machu Picchu, and other locations that were used by the Inca as ceremonial sites, it's obvious that there were megalithic works there prior to their existence. And each one of those megalithic works is also heavily damaged, not by people uh, striking rocks against them, but something catastrophic happened in that location, wiping out the ancient civilization that had lost ancient high technology. Wow, fascinating. Now, this is incredible. Again, advanced technology, engineering at its best. This throne, this seat, uh, these two seats carved right out of the rock and you rub your fingers against it. It seems like you see no evidence of any kind of chiseling or any kind of uh, modern day tool work on here. How was this made? What's your thoughts on this uh, process of 
how this is possible. Well, another interesting thing is that there are no sharp corners. So every every corner uh, appears like it was made using a router of some kind, but we see no tool marks, and that's what's very intriguing. When you look at ancient Egypt, we can see the use of ancient high technology in terms of power tools, but in Peru, there don't seem to be any tool marks whatsoever. So we're looking at the possibility of this ancient advanced culture being able to manipulate the matter itself, possibly turning hard stone into almost like a toffee material temporarily, shaping it and then letting it reset as hard stone again. Via maybe a sound wave or some kind of a laser type carving tool, what, what would you think? Yeah, it's more likely that it was sound, not not light. So um, some kind of the ability to be able to strike a certain frequency and manipulate the matter itself, shape it, and then turn that frequency back off and let the, the stone solidif- or re-solidify. Well, almost like turning a rock into putty and then letting it uh, dry up again into its uh, form after once it's molded. This is uh, amazing because you see in, again, more video that you've taken and it's a, quite incredible. You capture this in 4K, everybody. You got to take a look at Brian Forrester's YouTube channel, but I see you take out the level on your iPhone or some kind of app and this thing levels up perfectly. This is even hard to even do in uh, modern day buildings. Yeah, that's what's quite amazing. And these surfaces are several thousand years old. Yet when you put a, and of course there's lots of earthquake activity that happens in that part of Peru. But um, any place that you find this megalithic work in the bedrock itself, you find that the surfaces are easily within one degree of being perfectly level, which is an astonishing achievement. And what are we looking at here? Some people are claiming it's the biggest mega structure ever discovered. This thing is massive. And Brian's with us and he was there on location. Thus the incredible imagery that you're looking at right now. Brian, welcome back to Third Phase of Moon. Always a pleasure, thank you. All right, so now uh, we're looking at this. What do you think this represented? Why did they build this thing? Is it some kind of pillar? It's very strange. The standard story is that uh, is that Baalbek was built by the Romans, but you have these foundation blocks that weigh a thousand tons. There are three in a row, and then in the quarry there, that stone is estimated to be at least twelve hundred tons. Yeah, there's really no explanation of any reason why it was built, other than uh, just to build something huge. Do you think this thing was actually standing up vertical at one point? The three. Uh pillars that were discovered there no it's still actually attached to the bedrock which is really interesting uh there's another one in the quarry that weighs about a thousand tons and that uh that stone was partially quarried later by the romans but we're obviously looking at examples of lost ancient high technology and a mysterious unknown civilization that was there thousands of years before the romans ever existed yeah, this is some of the biggest questions people uh, want to have answers to. How old do you really think these things are? 40,000 years or even older? Well, I think um, a lot of the structures we see like that and also some of the work in Egypt and Peru is at least 12,000 years ago because we do have evidence that there was a global cataclysm 12,000 years ago, uh, which also is the time frame for when Atlantis was supposedly collapsing. So uh, that's the best estimate we have, at least twice as old a civilization as we know it. Yeah, this cataclysmic uh, event, is there any kind of evidence of what it was exactly? Was it maybe an asteroid, a, a big tidal wave, a massive earthquake? Well, there's a lot of evidence from different scientists that it was something that came from outside of our galaxy, either a comet or asteroids or something like that that hammered the Earth and caused the end of the last ice age, the rising of sea level by more than 300 feet, huge earthquakes and uh, volcanoes erupting and stuff like that, ending civilizations. Absolutely. So we see in the video, you basically have really um, unrestricted access to this thing. You're able to walk on it. What do the people in the area 
think it really is. Is there any explanation from uh, the park over there of what their theory is? Well, the great thing is that it's actually on um, on private property, as far as I know. It it was the garbage dump of the area until this man decided that he wanted to clean it up and uh, offer it to the public. So the local people in general believe that um, the Romans built it, or those that want to go a little more extreme believe that the Nephilim or the fallen angels built it because Mount Hermon, which is uh, where the Bible tells us that the fallen angels descended, is only a couple of hours' drive away. Yeah, so this guy just so happened to stumble across this thing and that is absolutely amazing so do you see any kind of modern or any kind of a uh, tooling on there any chips or again is this some kind of mysterious uh, kind of reasoning on how this thing was constructed well we actually see the tool marks it's like a series of parallel chisels which is also what we see on the Giza plateau and also at Petra in um, Jordan. So I think it could have been the same ancient culture that was working in all three locations 12,000 plus years ago. So when you walk on it, how do you feel? Do you feel some kind of energy coming from it? This thing must have took uh, who knows how long to construct. Well, I think we're definitely looking at high-tech tools that were used. Uh, the stone is limestone, so it's kind of energetically neutral as compared to something like granite. But just when the you see it for the first time from a distance, it looks like a movie set. Yeah, it's, it's basically almost surreal. It does look like almost a movie prop. Why would this uh, be even built for what reason? Maybe, like you say, it wasn't uh, f completed. It's still connected to the bedrock. If this were in its final stages of completion, what would you imagine it would look like? Would it stand vertical, or is this just their basic purpose to show that they could build something out of the bedrock? I think it was going to be a horizontal stone that was, was to be moved to the actual Baalbek site, which is about a mile away. And it, it appears that some event suddenly stopped the work on the project. And I, I think that was an ancient cataclysm that simply hammered that location and other places in Egypt and Greece and Turkey and, and places like that, all, maybe all at the same time. So as far as this structure, it is basically the biggest known structure of one single piece of uh, rock in a formation that we know of, correct? Yeah, I mean, it's the, it's, in terms of science, science has, has shown that um, clearly it's an artificial construction. Some people have said that there are megalithic sites in Russia, etc., that are bigger, but I've seen no actual scientific evidence of that. So the Baalbek stones are probably the largest stones ever worked on, um, ever. You've been taking us all around the world, from Peru, now we're in Egypt, and we're going to be uh, case filing the Sphinx here, and the Sphinx has many mysteries. People wonder if they're uh, basically chambers within the Sphinx itself or possibly underneath it. If you had an excavation license and you were greenlit, ready to go, where would you start and why in relation to the Sphinx? I would explore the area in, in, uh, in front of the the pause of the Great Sphinx. Yeah, we see that you were explaining in the video that there is some kind of boardwalk, uh, possibly to mask what's really underneath there. What, what's your thoughts? Yeah, that's what's really interesting, and that's the information you get when you're actually in Egypt. What I found out is that Dr. Robert Schock, who was the geologist able to date the Sphinx at being at least 12,000 years old, they did ground penetrating radar and they found at least one chamber existed underneath the, uh, the front paws of the Sphinx. So when he left, Zahi Hawass and the Egyptologists decided to start doing excavations very late at night. And they supposedly were able to find and uh, excavate this chamber. And that's why the boardwalk has been put over top of it to hide the fact that they've already done the excavation.
So you're saying that history has been written. They're not letting us know exactly what's going on. Was this a the present day government? This was um, during the time of Mubarak. So probably the 1990s um, when there was extreme cover up going on in Egypt. Um, but again, it's from local knowledge that you learn certain things like the boardwalk you're standing on was put in place to hide a secret excavation um, in search of the Hall of Records. Tell us a little bit more about the Hall of Records. Okay, the Hall of Records, I believe, was first described by uh, Edgar Casey, who was a clairvoyant, very famous uh, um, American. And he stated that there was um, a Hall of Records underneath the front paws of the Sphinx that contained ancient information, possibly carved on gold or other uh, metallic tablets, talking about the true history of humanity. So you're saying somebody has possession of these incredible artifacts, information? Well, we do know, thanks to Robert Schock, that there is at least one chamber underneath the Great Paws of the Sphinx, and that it, it has been excavated, and any artifacts, um, if they existed, would have been removed. We also know that there's a, a huge series of tunnels under the Giza Plateau that go from north uh, to south and east to west. And where could they possibly lead? It just goes on and on, the mysteries of Egypt and the Sphinx itself. There are these photos of photographic historic evidence of what it appears to be some kind of like manhole on the top of the Sphinx's head itself. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, there are actually some old photographs of, um, of a man standing inside of it. Uh, um, it's been covered in concrete since that time so it's uh we're not sure if it's actually an entrance to the hollow core of the sphinx or if it's simply a depression in the top that's something that would require something like a drone or a quadcopter to fly over and see yeah and they're not allowing any uh, drone flights over there i take not at all okay the yeah so who really is in charge of uh, this you know historic amazing you know, location and are, is the government over there doing any kind of new exploration or excavation of the, of the area? Yeah. Since, uh, Zahi Hawass was basically kicked out because of corruption and other things, um, alleged, uh, in, I think in the last two years, there's a new ministry of antiquities who's actually much more open-minded and he's opening up sites that have previously been prohibited to, uh, the general public. Well, that's, uh, at least the access is opening up now. So basically, who really built the Sphinx, in your opinion? A lot of people are giving the pharaohs the credit. Well, we do know, thanks to uh, geologists, there are actually 200 of them around the world that have confirmed that the vertical weathering on the Sphinx had to have been done by precipitation. So extensive rain over hundreds if not thousands of years and the last time the climate in that area uh, would have been that wet uh, would be at least 10,000 years ago so that's twice the age of the dynastic Egyptian or pharaonic culture but whether it's 12,000 or 20,000 or 30,000 uh, will re require more geological analysis um, but we, we do know that whatever culture did this had to have high technology of some kind because the area where the Sphinx is is called the Sphinx Enclosure and all the stone that was removed to reveal the Sphinx is right in front of it, which is the Sphinx Temple. And uh, there you have multi-ton blocks, some 40 tons or more in size. Most Egyptologists believe that the Sphinx is probably about 4,500 years old and is contemporary with the construction of the Great Pyramid. But again, uh, they're speculating, whereas the geological evidence is proving that it has to be at least 10,000 years old. Could you describe to us what you would visually see if you would step back in time 12,000 or to, you know, 10,000 years ago and describe what the Sphinx would have looked like in its completion back then? Well, it probably looked like a lion. Uh, we do know that the face has been recarved at least one, if not two times. And uh, throughout its history, it's been buried in sand up to its neck. 
And so the erosion on the surface of the body is much more extensive than on the face. And that proves that the face has been recarved, probably in dynastic times. And the face is completely out of proportion with the body. So originally, most, uh, most experts I know believe that the Sphinx was in the shape of a lion and its eyes were pointing towards the star Sirius. What an amazing sight that would uh, be. Brian Forrester, keep up uh, your amazing adventures around the world. Uh, we look forward to have you back next week. And we've got some questions for you. And if anybody wants to uh, have a question for Brian, please leave it in the comments below. And whatever comment gets the most thumbs up, we'll uh, bring that over to Brian Forrester. Thanks for uh, joining us and be sure to check the link out to Brian's YouTube channel. He's uh, posting pretty much, I don't know, how often are you posting, Brian? Uh, about every four days, so not as much as you guys. <laughs> oh, oh, wow. But you are uh, you're on location. It's quite incredible. And thanks for sharing, Brian. Take care and be safe. Always a pleasure. Aloha. And underneath the paws. Also, what we can see up here is uh, evidence that... Um, the officials were drilling into the bedrock in order to see if there was an underground chamber. But have a look at the locations of where the actual drill holes are. So this is about halfway down the body of the Sphinx. And you can see these caps are on top of uh, angle drilling, core drilling. I believe in the 90s or perhaps after that in order to see if there are holes or chambers or tunnels under the Sphinx. As we round the, basically the elbow. And here we have another one. And here we have another one. But again, what's curious is the transition between the bedrock here <clears throat> and these obvious blocks which were set into place. They're, they're basically at ground level. So do they represent a cover over top of the chamber? And is the front access to the Sphinx, in fact, right in this area here, covered by the boardwalk? Because again, when we go to this side, the bedrock is there, the slabs are here, continuing all the way to the end of the other paw, where again we have the bedrock. <laughs>